then this week is we're going to finish the isms. Somebody erased my isms, so I'm a little sad about that, but that's okay. Um, if you guys go to Unit 6 and go to Notes, and then go to Isms Notes, and say AP Euro Isms, which is, I think, the fourth one. Some people have been creating Google Docs, which is cool. All right? But this is where we're at. All right, and we've looked at conservatives, we've looked at the classical liberals, and we've looked at the modern liberals or the utilitarians, and I'll explain a little bit more about the utilitarians after we get to the socialists, because frankly, the modern liberals or the utilitarians kind of dug in because there was a threat from socialists. Meaning that if classical liberalism doesn't make some kind of modifications, then the alternative is going to be socialism in one form or another. All right. So we're going to look at socialism today, um, and I don't know how far we're going to get with it. We're going to at least look at Bong, and Bong is the first of the socialist movements. Uh, but before we even get to that, wh what do you think the precedent is? What is the, the European history precedent for socialism in practice, if there's ever been one? What do you think? Potentially. But usually there was some landowning aristocrat that owned everything. All right, as... I mean, you could make an argument that maybe somewhere in the bowels of the of the Ural Mountains and the highest reaches, we might have seen some kind of socialist experiment amongst the Cossacks. But it's hard to know because I mean, nobody was really there, uh, you know, with the video camera to see how they they kind of conducted their affairs on a day-to-day -day basis. But socialism, as a as an idea, is that cooperation can be taught and ultimately that cooperation could replace competition in some kind of capacity. Um, the period that we're looking at for that is the French Revolution. That's really the closest place that we've actually seen what socialism might look like if it were applied. And that was particularly true in that period known as Levé en masse. Despite the fact that you had Robespierre, despite the fact that you had the Reign of Terror, at least conceptually, it was this idea called total war that was introduced by the French. And the logic of it was, we are fighting for national survival. So if that were true, and you said every able-bodied person ages 18 to 60 is now conscripted into the army and will serve, that women would fill whatever roles were left as men were conscripted into the army, children would make sacrifices, that usually in a time of war, particularly if it's a war that threatens the very existence of your state or your country or your nation or whatever you want to call it, then people will make supreme sacrifices of their individual liberties in order to make sure that that end is achieved. You know, if it means like it did for the United States during World War I or World War II, where, um, you know, I won't use as much heat during the cold winter months, or I might conserve and not use as much paper, or I might uh, sacrifice, you know, some of my meals because I know that there's soldiers on the front that need to be fed. Whatever that is, that's a socialist mentality. That is, that whatever I need is not nearly as, as important as the collective, all right, what everybody else needs. And that need is genuine, as opposed to, you know, I need uh, an iPad 9, or whatever the hell, an iPad X, or I need a, what the hell have I been hearing recently? I need a, some kind of miniature skateboard. Bank board, what is that what it's called? Penny, Penny board. Penny board, yeah. I need one of those. Alright, I need um, Call of Duty for PS4 or whatever. Those are not needs. That's the great beauty of, of unbridled capitalism is that it conflates desires and wants and then retrains the brain to think that they're needed. Okay? 
Like the body will not survive if not for Call of Duty, you know, whatever edition, World War II edition. Right? That's just stuff. They're things, they're material goods. We're talking about needs like food, shelter, you know, clothing, things like that. Right? And that's ultimately where the socialists kind of fall down is on a couple of ideas that what is needed can be provided. For everybody. And then the second part of it is that they recognize property as taking the natural place in the new hierarchy. That when birth and custom and tradition had created these different, you know, hierarchical structures that said these folks, because they've got does and vons or whatever next to their name, are somehow more important or more entitled or more. Um, you know, held in higher regard or have more access simply because they are. And that ultimately property qualifications took on that same void. That one had to possess property, had to own property, had to accumulate property, and had to have a certain amount of property to be considered, I don't know, important uh, politically. That they put restrictions that said if you don't have a certain amount of property, you can't vote. You can't hold elected office. So the titles that were the earls or the counts or the viscounts or the dukes or whoever it was that used to be the political structure now has gotten replaced by this property qualification. And so they recognized that. And they recognized also that property in some regards is theft. It's somebody else's labor that has allowed other people the opportunity to collect said property and that property is used for very individual greedy self-interested things and the people that don't possess are kind of left out. All right. So ultimately, what, what, you, what socialism is trying to do is it's trying to figure out a way to reorganize society along the lines that the social, the society as a whole, owns the property, or the community as a whole owns the property, or the state as a whole owns the property, as opposed to the individuals, or a few select individuals. Right, so that's the goal. And you've heard it in, its, in all of its glory, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Add gender pronoun as you see fit. The point of the matter was is that they're ultimately trying to get to a society where the means of production, the means of distribution, the means of ownership are shared collectively. Okay? Amongst everyone. You're going to get out of that, me, mine. You know, that you've been taught since you were like old enough to like say stuff. My, you know, like my pacifier. My baba. Mine. And then you take it from ah! instead of an infant like being trained to say, ah, yes, of course. <laughs> to each according to his needs. That's a hell of a project. But it's one that a lot of these folks sitting around were thinking if somehow we could retrain human beings and human nature to be cooperative before they're competitive. To be other regarding as opposed to self regarding. There's a picture of uh, just a videotape of, of our, our fair president like going up the, um, the jetway on the stairs. And it was raining out, and he's got this massive golf umbrella. He's got it over his head. And then his nine or ten year old son, Baron, and his wife are three or four steps behind him with no cover, with the wind blowing them practically off of the off of the tarmac or whatever the case is. Alright? You know. It was just a universal idea that the umbrella has the ability to cover us all. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so then the part, the project becomes, all right, first of all, which social class seems to be kind of into this? Socialism. The lower classes, the have-nots, obviously. 
All right, the haves maybe not as much, unless they're just good people. And there were some good people that recognized that maybe society oriented in this way would be a hell of a lot better. So then it just becomes about method, and that's where I told you before that we see different approaches to that goal. That goal being social ownership, collective ownership, the idea that society can be trained to be cooperative rather than merely competitive. And to come up with a mantra that says, you know, from each according to his abilities, meaning whatever I got, I got for everybody, and then to each according to his needs. All right? And that wants and desires are not the same things as needs, and people come up with that recognition. So the first group to come along is the, the Bong Socialists. All right? And the reason that they get that name is that it's not really movement oriented. It's a bunch of people that are sitting around writing or thinking, smoking, whatever the case may be, and saying, wouldn't it be great if society were more like this? How great it would be for people to love one another and share. You know? So it is a very hippie kind of thing, right? So here are some of your people, all right? The first one that's on the list um, is Count Henri de Saint-Simon. His work is called The New Christianity. He's a writer. There isn't really a whole lot to it, other than it would be like taking Plato's Republic and making it the Industrial Revolution. So instead of the philosopher kings, he believes that those that understand like the industrial economy would be the ones that become the philosophers, You know, the ones that are going to run government and that would benevolently uh, provide because they're locked into this, this notion from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. So it is almost like a top-down sort of thing. But scientists and technicians and engineers would be the ones that, ones that are running the government, but they're doing it so that the government is effective and that indus industrial, you know, the industrial economy is working for everyone. Okay? And he does make a distinction between parasites and doers. And who are the doers? The people that work. The people that labor. The majority of the people, as it turns out. The parasites, those are the people that prey, that prey off of the labors of others and bear the fruits of their labor. And those are the folks that need to be eliminated. Those are the folks, not in a, like a genocidal sort of way, but that the society needs to be reoriented towards the doers. Okay. The next guy that's on the list is Charles Fourier, and he's more of a Rousseauian. Rousseau always got misinterpreted because the general will got applied to like the state, like the architecture of a very large place. Whereas I think Rousseau, if he was really looking, was looking more localized, like, like a commune kind of thing. All right? And so Fourier is the same way. He's like, you can't organize like an international economy in this way. But you could certainly do it in small kind of village sort of things. And he, so he came up with this thing called the phalanx. Or I think it's spelled phalanstery. Like monastery except phalanx. All right? Which would be these like little pockets of about 800 to maybe 1600 people who would be working collectively. But he was also like a util kind of guy. You're looking for maximizing pleasure and realizing that people that are like in jobs that are mundane and they're repetitive are ultimately like going to suck the life out of you. So he wanted people to be able to have freedom of movement to do things that gave them pleasure but would ultimately be productive for the group as a whole. All right. So that's what he got. There was a couple of things. The other is, is that he's way ahead of his time for uh, the emancipation of women. And so it makes him sound like he's freaking Charles Manson in some way. Okay? There is this hippie commune sort of idea that people are going to work. You know, some people will do the agricultural. Some people will do the craft. Some people will do the industry. And then whatever the commune has produced, it will provide for each other. And then they all reap the rewards 
of, of whatever is produced. Okay, but then it was more of a free love kind of thing. He really hated um, what's the word? Marriage. He saw marriage as like I think he called it organized or legalized prostitution. <laughs> All right. So that was kind of one of his arguments. Um, and so when he's writing about it, he says, Marriage distorts the natures of both men and women since monogamy restricted their sexual needs and narrowed the scope of their lives to just the family. Instead, people should think of themselves as part of the family of all of humanity. Because married women had to devote all their strength and time to household and children, they had no time or energy to left to enjoy life's pleasures. And that's, that's a good thing, you know, for women to say, like, your whole defining characteristic is to tend to children and family. And they're like, well, what's in it for you, man? Where's your Thelma and Louise moment, you know? So he kind of, like, builds that up. Fourier did not call for the abolition of the family, but he hoped that it would disappear on its own accord as society adjusted to his theories. Men and women would find new ways of fulfilling themselves sexually, and the community would be organized so that it could care for the children. So everybody's just kind of loving everyone, and then the children are kind of like the world's children, and everybody, and so it, it had this really cool, like Mansonian vibe to it. And so you can imagine, that while he's sitting around in his apartment waiting for somebody to start funding these phalanxes, um, that there's going to be not a lot of people willing to step up and say, oh yeah, Charlie, that's a good idea. Because he is a Charlie, right? He's a Fourier instead of a Manson, but you get the same idea. And I'm not saying that he's Manson. Right? He's, he didn't have a plan to go out and try to create a racial war by slaughtering a bunch of celebrities. He hadn't gotten that far yet. All right. And he certainly wasn't hearing like Beatles lyrics, you know, that were telling him to kill. Right. But he said, you know, socialist communities, about 1,600 people working together in farm and workshop, they would perform the type of work they most enjoyed. Uh, he hoped that philanthropists would come forward to subsidize the establishment of phalanxes, but none ever did. Okay? So, you can make an argument that he is like a prophet that saw late 60s California. Mm. You know what I mean? That people can get together, man, and they can make music, and they can make love, not war. You know, and so that's kind of where he was. All right? Louis Blanc was also interesting because his was kind of like a link story. All right? called the organization of work. And so here's how it works. Ultimately, the working class is given suffrage. Suffrage is not the same thing as suffering. Suffrage means the vote. Okay? There's this old video that was circulating some, some predominantly women's college. All right? Where this guy was running around to these college-age women and saying, uh, we're trying to end women's suffrage. Will you sign a petition? And he got hundreds of women at that college to sign off. He's like, she's like, yeah, we got to end women's suffering, you know, our suffrage. It's been going on too long. And he's like, yeah, you're right. Sign here. And it took until like the very end of the video for somebody to like ask, what is suffrage? And then some woman looks at him and goes, it's the right to vote. Don't sign it. And then they have like this light bulb that went on and said, smart. <laughs> but yeah, they didn't know. Suffrage, they thought, it sounds like suffering, so it must be, instead of it being the right to vote. So anyway, he wanted to give workers the universal voting right that would give them the ability to kind of Bernie Sanders the system, right? Get working class voices with working class ideas. And then the big idea would be, First, we're going to nationalize the railroads. Then we're going to take that plus tax revenue to fund what he called socialist workshops or social workshops. These were socialist factories, factories that were involved in textile production or whatever it happened to be, and that they were going to be socially owned. 
meaning that whatever was generated by the people would be distributed equally among the people. And the fact that you were, you as a worker were part owner of that company, just as all the workers were, that you would work a hell of a lot harder than your typical John Q exploited worker who was making just above subsistence. So then you put the cooperative in competition with the exploitive and eventually the cooperative workshops will completely blow the exploitive workshops out of, out of business. They won't be able to compete. All right? And then they could use that to ultimately monopolize those sectors of the economy and then they could start building socialist workshops to do the same thing in other sectors of the economy until the entire economy is reorganized around these socialist collectives. How do you do? Never happened. Sounded good. And eventually Louis Blanc was involved in the 1848 revolutions in France. But his big proposal was that we have to give workers jobs. And so the jobs that some of them did was like one day they would dig a hole and then the next day they would fill it. And everybody's like, he never got the funding for the socialist cooperatives and France didn't get universal suffrage for a really long time. All right. Next guy on the list is Robert Owen. We've talked about Robert Owen. Robert Owen at one time was on the other side. He was a textile owner. He had factories up in Scotland. Uh, they called them New Lanark. This was the region. Those were his textiles. Uh, and he was killing it, meaning that they were out-producing or out-profiting um, all of the other textile mills anywhere um, around. And the odd part about it was he was a good boss. You know, he gave the workers decent wages. There wasn't any child labor. Uh, he provided education. They had open spaces and picnic areas, and it was well lit, and it was environmentally responsible. And all these people from all around would come and visit his workshops and say, yo, man, where are all the exploited people? Where are you, cure where are you keeping, like, the six-year-olds? <laughs> and he was like, well, we don't have any six-year-olds. Um, and you know they were like wait a second you mean you give them a decent wage and that they feel like they belong that they have dignity which means that they're actually going to work harder for you he's like yeah that's kind of how it works and so that becomes his thing you know but he gets bigger than that he's like all right I made my money but I'm also like a real real human being so now I want to kind of become the agent you know, for the working class. So one of the things he tries to do is organize a national trade union. All right, when you see it in the notes, it says GNCTU, stands for Grand National Consolidated Trade Union, which was wishful thinking, but the idea that you could actually nationalize a union, it was maybe too early uh, for the British Parliament to be down with. Um, and then he was also involved in the Sadler Commission reports that if you recall those, that's where the child labor like atrocities were kind of aired, you know, at, at you know, parliamentary hearings. And it ultimately led to the Factory Act, which then put some temper on the kind of things that were happening in child labor practices. And then after that he kind of got, you know, real grandiose in his visions and said, I'm gonna take, you know, my ideas and I'm gonna take my fortune and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna build um, socialist communities in the United States. So he goes to America and he settles in all places, Indiana, and in forms Indiana? this place that he calls New Harmony. Yeah. So I've got it, man. We're going to build this place and from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And it lasted like a few months. Everybody kind of bailed on it. Why? I don't know. Maybe human nature took over. Okay. Maybe the one person that said, from each according to my abilities, is a ton better than them according to their ability. You know, or somebody said, I need this. And somebody said, No, you don't. Say, Yes, I do. 
If there is a if there is a deep dish pizza, I need four slices. No, you don't. You need one. Everybody gets one. You understand? Yeah. It's it's socialism. It's a, it's quixotic. It's idealistic, but impractical. And the reason why is because human nature has not yet effectively been taught how to be cooperative. All right? Except where? War? Yes. If you could say your national survival depends on you being cooperative and being other regarding. Two, a couple of days leading up to Christmas. Okay? Three, a couple hours before Thanksgiving dinner. Okay? Five, after a natural disaster. Four, after a natural disaster. Okay? Five, if you've ever played team sports. And even then, you'll notice that the majority of teams you've ever been on, there's been that one person that's got to score all the goals, that's got to score all the, the you know the, the baskets, um, that's got to you know got to like take over the stat sheet. That is not comfortable just playing their role. Okay, you want to meet socialists? Meet the offensive line. Those guys are socialists. All right. The offensive line in most football teams, those guys are socialists. Because all they're doing is making sacrifices for everybody else. So somebody else can get the glory and they're like, no worry. I'm happy we scored. Right? They also get pretty good salaries in the end. <laughs> but they also get CTE quicker than anybody else. So, anyway, so socialism <coughs> is that. I mean, it, and that's kind of why it, it, it sort of is bong. Okay, bong is sort of this. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if people were cooler to one another? Be so much more peaceful. You know, like I have some bread. I'll share it with my brother. I'll share it with my sister, Kumbaya. You know. John Glennon will come peek out from around the corner. Say, wouldn't it be wonderful if no religion either? You know. <laughs> and so, um, that's basically where you're at. You know. And so, the other one that's on there, her name is Flora Tristan. Um, she also fits into this category, and and aptly so, uh, because she's sort of double trouble, if you will, for the powers that be, because. She believes in, in workers' emancipation, but she also believes in women's emancipation. And she kind of sees that both of those movements kind of have to be successful.